So I was studying the book of Haggai uh, earlier. Haggai is not a book that is often studied, at least not in a public forum. Usually we kind of gloss over a lot of those minor prophet books in the back half of the Old Testament. But Haggai is an interesting book. It's only a couple of chapters long, and so it could be read in half an hour at that. Uh, the the idea behind the book, the circumstances in the writing, are the the people of, of God, the uh, the Jews, had gone into exile in Babylon and then later Persia, and they had been given permission to go home. And so about 40,000 of them have returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the city, and particularly the temple in Jerusalem. And Haggai writes to kind of motivate them to build the temple as they're supposed to do, which is why they were sent back in the first place. And the book takes place alongside the book of Ezra. And what we read in Ezra chapter 3 is that when the foundation of that new temple was laid, the old Jews who remembered the first temple that the Babylonians had destroyed uh, wept because it was so much smaller and so much more pedestrian and less, you know, extravagant than the old temple that Solomon had built. Uh, and Haggai kind of covers that same territory in Haggai chapter 2, around verse 3, 4, and 5 or so, God speaks to the people in the midst of their great disappointment at the new temple. Keep in mind, the temple is being built for God. So it's his opinion that counts. But the old Jews are sad that their old temple and their old extravagant life is basically gone forever. Uh, and so what I love about this text in Haggai 2 is how God plays the role of an encourager. How God is someone who wants to who doesn't want you to feel bad about the service that you give him if you give him the best you've got. When Solomon built his temple, Israel was swimming in gold and gemstones and in the, the means to create a, a lavish, extravagant building. And so Solomon gave God the very best. By the time the new temple is being built uh, under Zerubbabel and um, the, the high priest Joshua, they're, they're, they did not have the money. They did not have the resources. They did not have the means to create such a lavish building. And so it was a much smaller, much more pedestrian-looking structure. But God does not care about the outward appearance. God does not care how little you have to give him as long as you give him what you can give him. And so the people built God a very pedestrian-looking building. And God says to the people, basically, I see that you're looking at it and I can see that you're sad, but don't be. Keep at it. Keep working. It's going to be okay. This is my house, and I will dwell with you in it. So it's just a very encouraging thing by my Lord. He doesn't say, where's all the gold? He doesn't say, where are all the gemstones? He doesn't care about that. The Lord doesn't care about the outward appearance. The Lord cares about the heart. We see that going all the way back to the uh, selecting of David to be the new king of Israel. When Elib was so uh, so much taller and, and more kingly appearing. He looked very much like the old King Saul, head and shoulders above everyone else. But God doesn't care about that. God cares about the heart. So you may not have as much to offer as the Christian next to you. You may not have as much to give. You may not have the same abilities, the same skill sets as other Christians. But don't worry. You give God the best you can. Give him what you can with what you have, wherever you are. And God will be satisfied because that's what God wants. He just wants your heart. And he knows if he has your heart, the right actions will follow. So give God the spirit and the truth and let him worry about the details and how much and how little is, is relevant. Let him worry about that.